Ladies and gentlemen, here we are again at the ACHL Digital Event, and we've got two further guests, two well-known characters in the business and um, personal friends. So I'm really looking forward to this session. So firstly, we have Olivier Bajoui, who's president and owner of OB Invest, and Patrick Tersh. And I've left out the O Tersh this time, Patrick, because of the uh, Irish connection <laughs> previously. Too bad. Um, who's Look, the CEO I'll... of LU? Yeah, always good with green. LUG Air Cargo Handling. Gents, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Hi. Hey, looking very, very relaxed there, Olivier. Lovely to see. Yeah, you know, pretty, pretty, you know, it's better to be relaxed this day than than the country. You know, so it is indeed. That's what I'm trying, I'm trying to get through. <laughs> it is indeed. So, gents. Um, before we kick off with uh, just some general discussion points, what I'd like you to do, please, if you can just give um, our listeners just a, a very brief insight into how this damn crisis has affected you and, and in what way over the last four to five months. So if we kick off with you, Patrick. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I deliberately wore the Irish tie today, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you, missed, you left out the old shirt part. But anyways, it's... Um, yeah, as you can see, I'm, I'm actually in good spirits because uh, you know, the crisis has affected us in such a fashion that, uh, like everybody else, we went from from 100 to a zero within two days. But uh, at least in Frankfurt, uh, where we operate our main uh, facility, we went from zero to 180 within another two days. So basically, uh, what happened here is, is that we we went from from uh, shall we say a standardized world with all the the long haul boys flying into Frankfurt and some of the operating freighters to a basically purely freighter operated uh, station um, for the lack of or actually for the sake of, of us giving up Hamburg and, and Munich in a sense we're still operating there but uh, on margins of what we used to do in the past but overall the message is actually very positive um, as, a, as a group as a whole financially and, 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 and from, a, from a volume perspective we're way better than the last year which is sort of bizarre but we can't complain and we're actually very upbeat that this will continue so yeah. Okay. All right. Good, good, good. And Olivier, and, and maybe just a little bit of background for, for anybody that's tuning in as to, you know, what uh, OB Invest is. Well, OB Invest is, a, is a, my own company, which I formed uh, when I, um, when I uh, retired from uh, WFS. And um, this company, you know, for me is a tool to invest in different businesses and, and that can go from Obviously, there is businesses in the cargo, of course, uh, like uh, GSAs in, in France, Italy, Spain, and uh, Holland. And there's also, you know, some handling company, one in Spain and one in uh, in uh, Liège Airport. Uh, and of course, you know, I invested also in some other business which are totally unrelated to uh, to cargo, which businesses are are of interest for me. Uh, uh, and um, so, basically. Obey Invest is just a tool to invest in various businesses, including businesses which are related to my uh, former background. Very good, very good. Always good to keep you in the business, huh? Well, I guess when you get the virus, you get the virus. I'm not talking about the COVID, I'm just talking about the cargo virus. Um, talking about the crisis, well, you know, the two businesses I have in the handling side are the one, one in, in Liège Airport and, and one in Spain, uh, uh, Madrid and Barcelona. To be, to be just like Patrick, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm fairly uh, uh, positive because, first of all, the, the one in Liège has been booming this uh, uh, year and a half. And, um, and during the COVID period, of course, first of all, I mean, there was all these charters of... Uh, mask and uh, and the pharmaceutical stuff that uh, were coming to uh, uh, Liège to be dispatched and also also all the e-commerce uh, guys that were sending more and more you know uh, shipment because simply because people were ordering more online during the, the COVID period so that part of the business has been doing very well Spain was a little bit more challenging but nevertheless we also handled uh, quite quite a number of uh, freighter operation in, in, in Barcelona and uh, in Madrid for, for some very large uh, forwarders. And uh, so again, you know, I, I don't complain. Um, the, the GSA where depending, you know, on what airline you do, and if you have some freighters, then you're okay. And if, if yeah. you have uh, 
uh, passenger well, it's a bit more challenging but fine overall i would say uh it's uh, fairly small businesses which you know can can deal with a uh, um i would say a fairly long period of uh, lower activity yeah no exactly um patrick can i can i just ask you something now um most businesses now they're realizing that perhaps some of the just-in-time concepts, some of the things that they took for granted have to be readdressed. And agility and resilience is very, very much now on the table in all meetings with regards to business continuity and sustainability. What, what lessons or what changes have you made with your business in regard to agility and resilience? Actually, very simple. That, we, that, that it's in our core DNA because uh, what has changed through uh, the COVID crisis in terms of, as I mentioned earlier, all the regular flying has disappeared in a sense. Um, you have to be agile in terms of being able to make smart decisions, whether you can take additional charters in, whether you, your, 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 your infrastructure holds up to, well, I, I was gonna say the new, the new environment, um, and that is a key issue. And, and, and quite, quite interestingly, when, when talking to our carrier clients and also forwarders nowadays, um, while their expectation is that you are actually fast, transparent, and, and all, you know, all the other buzzwords that we all used to in the past, it's, they don't necessarily mention them anymore. They, it's, it's, it's their core expectation, I would say, but they don't dispute you either. I mean, it's, it's more coming down to the point where, and I, I really like that, the way it's where you can talk on an eye to eye level whether you're capable of performing certain things or not. And, uh, and that, that has really been the biggest push now because the entire team now is, is actually agile because there's no other way around anymore. Um, you know, with all the freighter flying, there's barely a schedule that holds on for a longer period of time. You have all these, um, I, I don't like the word, but they, they call them freighters here, where, you know, the passenger converted freighters. Um, I mean, they won't, they won't last for long. And, and in a way, they don't, they don't have much of an impact to us other than the peace count went up dramatically. But um, you know, it's there is no consistent flight plan anymore, so you have to live from day to day uh, onwards. Plus, what interesting enough we see a lot is a lot of trucking coming in, especially in the inbound side, and that comes unannounced. Um, that is somewhat of a challenge, but yeah, again, um, if you're not agile these days, then you're out of business. Exactly. And uh, Olivier, um, with regards to agility and resilience, and also the support that's coming now from within the industry. Airports, do you feel now that airports are starting to realize that they've got a great opportunity to head up their own ecosystem and community and they can actually start making some difference for the entire the, the tripartite relationship of airport carrier and GHA? Well, you know, I think first of all, right now airports are trying to cope with their own problems, which, which the main one being linked with the passenger side and also with the duty-free uh, uh, commerce kind of stuff. So whether cargo, whether the airport has, you know, realized through that crisis that, uh, you know, I guess cargo is, is, a, is an important factor uh, on an airport. Honestly, I don't know. I, I've seen them, you know, uh, for so many years, not, not really considering cargo as, as, as an interesting aspect of the airport side. Probably beside the the only thing for them was the um, real estate aspect of it, but other than this, uh, I don't think that the major airport in Europe has really proved of being cooperative with with the cargo development in general. Now, is the COVID now bringing a different story? Maybe we'll see uh, how much interest there is. I think there's airport, for example, I think it's interesting to, to see how an airport like, which is mostly, you know, um, bound by uh, belly carriers and, and no freighters, say London Heathrow, uh, will react after this crisis. Because Heathrow was known for not, not having any slots for freighters, as we know. Yeah. And that, the freighters had to go to Stansted and, and maybe even, you know, uh, further, further away uh, uh, in, in East Midland and stuff like this, like for the e-commerce part. So it would be interesting to see how they react after the crisis, because in any way, it's unlikely that most of the, uh, well, all the flights that were there before will resume before several years. And, and everybody is, I think there's a clear conscious that 
this is happening. I was reading uh, papers about, you know, uh, the Paris, for example. Yeah. Where the airport was seeing a return of basically 2019 volumes in general about everything. Uh, between two, two, um, 2024 and 2027, it's, it's quite a long time. And, you know, I think that when you see airports, you know, talking like this, I guess you realize how deep is 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 the um, is the scar, and so again, you know, let's see if, how they react after this crisis. Let's see uh, if they pay attention. Yeah. For the time being, you know, um, I, I haven't seen much uh, uh, about it. I don't know if Patrick, maybe Patrick, have seen more with uh, Fatport since uh, since the the COVID. If uh, they had more, you know, yeah. You know, positive attitude about cargo or more attention to it. Yeah, well, I was going to add to that. It, uh, my, my personal impression is and it naturally starts in Frankfurt, but it's not only um, about Frankfurt, is that I think a lot of major airports missed a big opportunity here for various reasons. Um, one of them is, is, you know, they all complain about, rightly so, that their passenger figures are declining, that, that their financials are out of sync and whatnot. But, you know, with, with, with Fridays for Future and everything else, else coming up, the, the missed opportunities is that airports could have shown to to the well to the world or at least to to the neighborhoods that how important they are you know and it's not only about passengers it's about flying in the PPE equipment and without the people without the freighters they would have, would not have been the PPE equipment as fast as we all needed it and that, that's one missed opportunity the other one is, is that um, I, I personally feel that I might, I might be wrong with that but that's my impression I, I have a feeling that World trade is actually going to pick up faster than 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 potential passenger flying. So what's going to what we will see is is that actually hubs like Frankfurt, like like Frederick, hubs like like Paris, like uh, Liège, they will continue to to remain on a very high level in terms of volumes, while secondary airports will will lack that. But, but the chance that or the opportunity that the airports miss there is that they don't understand still to that day that. Cargo plays a vital role for international long haul carriers to make a flight profitable. Yeah, and and now instead of embracing cargo and, and trying to, to to give cargo a bigger scheme of things, um, they they neglect cargo. They all complain about that they do the free shops closing down. But instead of doing something to enable airlines to come back and operate long haul flights again, they they still don't get the picture. And I I find that is well, um, it's frustrating. Yeah, the, the, the thing I, we had, what well, Patrick just said, uh, I think the problem is, is fairly deep because the problem with these airports, you know, not reacting as, as Patrick just described to maybe to the crisis and, 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 and show up in, in, and, and give a cargo more, um, more exposure. I think it's too late, to be honest. I think it's way too late in terms of uh, infrastructures because none of these you know, large airport has, has built what was necessary to, to welcome, you know, more cargo. And I think that the, right before the COVID, the trend was very clear. Less slots for freighters, more slots for passenger aircraft. Freighters should go somewhere else. This is what made Liège so, uh, uh, so strong in a very short period of time. And, and not even accounting for the e-commerce side, which which is also absolutely booming right now, and faster than we expect because now of the COVID. Yeah. One one of the problem is they didn't create the, infra the necessary infrastructure to welcome you know more. That's the case of all the airport in Europe. If you look one by one, who is actually capable of having first line capabilities expansion of uh, more volume into welcome more volume there's none nobody yeah. in that shape so really the only people that that cared about cargo were the people like liege why because they were building and building and building because it's their core business and and they were right because in a way right now you know they they are they are the very uh, fairly large you know additional square meters but it's already full it, it's already full simply because of the growth and on top of this I think that what the, the other, the, the main airport also, you know, we're looking at cargo like, like a, something which is a complementary on the belly capacity with passengers, nothing else. And, and that's why I think that reacting now, 
I, I'm not sure it's it's a, you know it's it's um, I think it's too late to be honest. Yeah, it's 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 um it's one of those it's one of those issues where where somebody sees an opportunity they become a specialist and then they attract the business and then the ones who had all the business in the first place because Sorry. of their tactical or their strategy they then tend to you know come come unstuck when something like this happens. We had a great session yesterday with Pittsburgh Airport and Anchorage Airport and Pittsburgh because of its land mass and its availability for growth and everything they're seeing you know huge opportunity so I, I agree with you Olivier I think you know in in some cases people have to do what they've got to do but it might be a little bit too late because of other influencing factors like the infrastructure access etc so there's going to be a yeah a big big readdress once this starts to calm down a little yeah and and there is one thing which which is also not pleading in favor of the large airport is the fact that the smaller airport, the guys who like Liège, who, are, who have you know grown cargo, or Pittsburgh, who, who is now ready maybe to shape up to to welcome cargo. Uh, the region is a pretty good cargo region, by the way, uh, the Pittsburgh region. And the, 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 one of the problem is now you know some of the carriers, and I'm not talking about airlines specifically. I'm talking about let's say e-commerce boy, people who, you know carry a lot of you know cargo charters, for example, but airline as well. They have now tasted. Uh, the fact that these airports, the smaller airport where they fly, are faster, yep. more yep. quicker. Trucks goes out much faster. So, why go to a, a an air and go back to an airport which is first of all ne never been very welcoming for cargo, but on top of this was very congested and likely it's some point you know in the next few years to be congested again. And so, again. You know, you 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 have the choice for 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 between an airport which is you know paying attention, and also have the capability of being fast because the local GHA uh, guys are efficient. It's it's new people they who have been you know uh, you know kind of coming to these airport and and growing a stuff which which was really adapted to the to the to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the airport, but you know. And that's my point. I think that today the 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 good aspect of the new air, the new smaller pure cargo airport uh, are are now in the mouth of of, of the big uh, transport guy. I mean, yep, hundred percent. And Patrick, one of the things I wanted to ask yourself there now, uh, just touching on Olivier's points there with congestion and access, etc. Are you finding a lot more uh, cooperation now? And collaboration with the forwarders with regards to deliveries, pickups, you know, more advanced information. Are, are you seeing a different, a different balanced approach now, because of the, um, you know, the fact that everybody's in the in the same storm. Might not necessarily be in the same boat, but definitely in the same storm. So, are you seeing a more cohesive understanding and awareness and discipline with regards to helping the supply chain be more effective? Um, it's funny you say that because we actually do. Um... I don't know if, if you guys remember, Olivier might, might as well remember, and I think uh, you too, Chris, because I think we, we talked about this back then, but in, in 2017 in Q4, uh, Frankfurt Airport was about to break down, or actually broke down. I mean, this whole airport collapsed in terms of cargo back then. And uh, why I mention this is because there was one big takeaway item that the whole community took from, from back then that apparently didn't work this time because when I mentioned earlier that, that we went from 100 to zero in two days and then uh, within the next two days from zero to 180 this affected everybody in this community and the big change was that um, especially the forwarding agents embraced communication and clear transparent well forms of, 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 of dealing with each other um, this airport was close to breaking down again uh, in March and we, we, we avoided it by, by actually talking to each other and finding ways and understanding on both sides of the table. And I, I find this as a clear success because um, the one thing is that, that I think the forward has realized fairly quickly is, is that volumes will outpace capacity for them time to come. And in order to make the entire system or the entire ecosystem work is you need to be clear in what, what the expectation is and you need to listen to your counterpart. And that has changed, I find, because uh, whoever I talk to in the industry um, in, in Germany, um, that that is the consensus nowadays, which is 
good to see. And, and, and actually, uh, I, I find it also very positive because it didn't need another breakdown. People remembered that there was a breakdown and that you can do something about it. And uh, we all went to action. Very good. Very good. And that's really, really good to hear because it's been long overdue. Now, on, on the continuity of that particular point and the collaboration, something that I think now, and it's, it, it's bugged me every time I hear people talking about it, and people are probably fed up with listening to me talking about it, but digitization and also the, the initiative to actually do something instead of keep talking about it. Now, from a hygiene perspective, if ever there was the time or an opportunity to use that as a catalyst to introduce a greater degree of, of digitization and paperless movement is now. And um, Olivier, do you think that's going to come about? Do you think that there'll be a, a you know, a, a broader acceptance that we have to move ahead now and stop all this stopping at a remote control post and then at a reception area? And then it goes from the reception area to exports and to build up and documents are handled so many times. It's ridiculous. Well, uh, Chris, if you, if you remember uh, one, one of the conference we had when I came back uh, and, and as the chairman, as a co-chairman, we, we discussed about this uh, story and then there was a panel of people, you know, uh, around the table with, uh, you know, from some G serious GHA, what I would call they were talking about this and, and honestly, I mean, as I said, you know, before in, in year 2000, the, the cargo 2000 was created and the purpose of it was the digitalization. Yep. The purpose of it was e airwheel The purpose was all what you described. We are in 2020 and, and I, I guess the conference I'm referring to was 2018. Have we made any progress? No. Um, I get, not that I'm aware, at least. So, you know, if, if I listen to the guys that were there at that time, yes, it was the, around the corner. They, there we are, you know, they, it's, it's on its way. But it's bullshit. I mean, this is absolute bullshit in 20 years. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and two years ago, we felt that something will happen we asked if something will happen to the gha and they said yes of course but nothing happened let's be clear now there's two types of digitalization right now there's, there's the one that is related to i would say usual handling uh, usual cargo handling for general cargo which is and, and i'm sure you know the forwarders are are fed up of this you know fed up of not seeing the gha you know pop pumping up and, and doing what they're supposed to do. And there's the other part of the sorry, digitalization, uh, which is related to the e-commerce side. But, but it's a different stuff. You know, it's, a, it's a different one. It's developed separately, but, but it, it's moving. And it's moving extremely fast because these guys are on the fast track. And I think that, again, you know, is some, some company... Uh, in isolation are trying to develop these these stuff but honestly uh, i haven't seen much progress there you know exactly uh, we've, we've been speaking to some people and there's been discussions about the depending where you sit politically and what your viewpoints are is whether or not you should incentivize people or whether you should just say this has got to be done my personal i i've always preferred the baseball bat to the to the uh, tickler and i think there's a time now where people just need to be told, look, whether it's from an airport community, whether it's from a carrier's perspective, and whether it's from a GHA's perspective, this is the way it's got to be from such and such a date. Now, Patrick, if that was given to you as a directive, would you be in support of that? Or would you want to debate it and discuss it with your forwarders and discuss it with everybody else? Uh, you know what, this is a mixed bag. It, um, I personally, I'm, I'm, I, I take the baseball bat too, personally. Um, the question is, is whether whether you know one single entity or one single player of the entire chain will will be able to change something. Why well, why well, I'm so reluctant is, is that I find there's there's one big obstacle that hardly is ever mentioned. Um, you know, when when you look at the capabilities of the carriers to communicate with you as a GHA in terms of the messaging, then this is sometimes sickening because. We have customers who are still on uh, on, on um, FHL version. I don't know eleven. Yep. yep. Now, 
And that is the biggest obstacle we see because wh whatever else we do with whoever else we talk, uh, we won't go any further because of, of that obstacle. I mean, I, I, have, I, I, I still have customers where we have to work in two ecosystems because we can't message into their system. And that is the obstacle. Yeah, which is madness, isn't it? Yeah, now, it's absolute madness. And, and, and it comes down to the point where, you know, how far can I go and how far can I push them? Because I might lose the contract over this because yeah. they won't change their system because of me. Um, and, and I might even handle them in, three, in all three stations, but still, it won't yeah. matter to and they'll, and they'll throw the gauntlet down that they'll go yeah. elsewhere with somebody who's more, who's more um, responsive and more considerate. But Patrick, what, what, what I've seen now is some of the representative bodies and the regulatory bodies, so EASA, ICAO, they've come out with some fantastic guidelines. They've been very, very uh, quick to respond, especially with the Prater issue and the best way, you know, to load and, and what to do with the seats, etc. So I think that's been really positive. But I think now also the representative bodies are being affected by the crisis. And obviously, if the industry that they represent is, is, is practical sizing, and I'm very cautious not to say right sizing or downsizing, but practical sizing, they also have to practical size. So they're also losing some of the expertise and some of the, the positions that they had in those, in those organizations. So I think now is a suitable time for them all to come together and consolidate the work and consolidate the objectives. And this is now a time where they could actually make some real clear, you know, very, very high impact decisions, which the rest of the market would accept because of the current situation. Now, do, do you agree with that? I, I do agree with that. And, 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 and actually on, on a more upbeat note too, and, you know, we, we have our workarounds and, and, and they're usually in a community level where you either come up with a community platform where the messaging does work within the community. So where the forwards can actually feed information into the platform, we can pull it and vice versa, where we in a sense bypass the carrier. Um, so, you know, we're, we're building an ecosystem around all that eventually leading to, to being more digitized. I mean, there's some, there's some local obstacles, which I, I guess will vary from, from country to country that, that deal mainly with aviation security, where you have to still uh, ensure some, some sort of ID um, verification with the drivers delivering. So there will still be some paperwork attached to it, but we are actually, we've been able to, to downsize, if you want to call it that, the amount of, of, of actual analog paperwork related work. You know, it, it, it's becoming more and more digital, but in general, as an industry, I think we're lacking the combined force. Yep, yep, so there's, there's definitely room for that. Now. On the topic of e-commerce, Olivier, and I know it's, it's something that's very close to your heart. Now, if you look at somebody like Patrick, who's fantastic there with his green tie matching the green leaf in the vase outside and the wonderful picture from the past of the double-decker bus in London. There you go. <laughs> I think it's going to be a long time till we see queues like that waiting to get on a bus. But um, from Patrick's perspective, e-commerce. So do you really think that there's a cohesive understanding and appreciation of how the supply chain, apart from, apart from the traditional integrators and e-commerce practitioners, do you think there's a good opportunity now for, for airport, airline, GHA to get together with a forwarder and have uh, you know, front first mile, last mile, all the way through product that they could then start to create and be part of themselves as integral parties rather than just deciding, is this commerce? What do I do with it? All the customs challenges, etc. What do you think, Olivier? Well, first of all, I think that, uh, you know, you, you mentioned about the supply chain, how to, you know, um, you know cope with e-commerce and how all these, all the players are. I think they're not, let's be clear. Uh, uh, they're not at all. Why? Yep. Because the e-commerce boy have run their own supply chain. And they have understood very quickly how to deal with it and how to, to, how to masterize, you know, that supply chain. Forwarders are not involved. Integrators are not involved. Airports, to a certain extent, of course, because there is, you know, aircraft fighting. Airline are involved as a charter airline. But basically what you see today is these guys over in, in Asia, in, in the Orient, they decide of everything. Yep. They decide where they're going to fly. They decide how much they're going to pay. Well, they decide how much of a, the market will decide how much they're going to pay to fly, you know, from, from the Orient to Europe or to the U.S. 
Uh, but, you know, they control it. I mean, if you really see, look at the involvement of the, you know, freight forwarders in relation with e-commerce right now, uh, you know, I invite you in, in Liège and you, and you will see how, how much is it. And what is it is, is, is sometimes a fairly small organization uh, uh, that is doing the custom clearance for all the, the, the stuff. And that's about it. Now, who decide? Um, again, you know, they, they, these guys in Asia will charter flights. The flight will go to Liège, will go to maybe another airport, depending on, 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 on what, you know, uh, where, they, where they want to fly. But they control everything today. Nobody is involved beside themselves to decide what's going to happen. Again, as a GHA, basically the, the contact is not the airline anymore. That's the e-commerce boy. Yep. And, you know, that's a fact. I mean, so I'm, I'm not sure, you know, that what, what does the, the existing, you know, players in the supply chain can do about this, I don't think they can do much. I th again, I think this guy decides for everything they want, and 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 which airport they're going to fly, which aircraft they're going to fly, which you know, all of this is is set, and and they're using you know, sort of major airlines sometimes with big names, but but basically they're chartering flights. Basically, what? chartering flights. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think, Patrick? I tend to agree. I mean, you know, coming back to what we earlier talked about, how, how airports are not embracing cargo nowadays. Um, I, I think you see that that's another f failure, so to speak, because if you take a look at Amazon as, as an example, Amazon, because I, I just happen to know what, they, what, what, they, what they're doing in Germany, they are bypassing all the big, big airports. And why is that? Because of the infrastructure. They set up the infrastructure themselves. They rather go to, to shall we say, a remote location where they but they can control everything and they know they're not going to be congested, but they have the process under control and they bypass the traditional hubs. That's a matter of fact. Whatever they started flying to in Germany was, was in remote airport. The only exemption might be Leipzig where they're building up um, a major hub right now. But um, I, f I still find it fits the picture because Leipzig has, has situated itself like in, in an integrated part, uh, port. So it's a perfect fit for them but they're bypassing all the major airports. They're not flying to Hamburg, they're not flying to, to, to Munich, they're not flying to Dusseldorf, they're not flying to Frankfurt, they bypass all these hubs. Yeah, no, it's amazing. But do you think, Patrick, that there's an opportunity there for the, for the traditional supply chain to get together and integrate better themselves so that they can offer at least, maybe not a, you know, a competitive alternative, but at least a specialist alternative? Yeah, I, 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 I think so. Um, uh, one, you know, take one step back. When, when, when we take a look at, at the secondary airports, there's a huge chance for the GHA situated there because Amazon will work with them, you know, as long as they provide the services. So there's, there's a chance where actually some of these boys might become more successful there than they were in the past because of the lack of flying they had there. They were all dependent on trucking. Now, now they might handle flights on a regular basis that are growing. And secondly, I, I believe there is a strong chance simply for the fact that we all look at, at the big companies like, like Amazon, as I just mentioned, but I'm sure e-commerce will also take off on smaller platforms and they need solutions and they're not, they don't have the financial powers themselves to set up the logistics arms themselves. So if, 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 we, if we manage to get them or offer them a product that they can deal with, then I think there's a huge chance because they, they will use traditional flying methods because of the lack of volume that they can create themselves and they need partners who can deliver uh, into the last mile, I think there's a chance. Okay, okay, good. Now, something that's, um, something that's come in and it's, it, it's already starting to, to gain a little bit of discussion and, and uh, debate is the vaccines and whether or not there'll be some sort of international vaccine commission or you know to identify capabilities of airports and providers within those airports because it'll have a different slant to it uh, whereby on the import side there'll probably be a, a higher requirement for storage and control distribution how do you how do you see that um, panning out now Patrick because obviously as LUG you've invested a lot in your facilities and you continue to do so um, you know what's your what's your position on that one I wish I have one. Uh, what I said is, is that uh, from, from all I'm, I'm gathering so far, there, there might be about 100 sites worldwide where they will be manufacturing the vaccines. Um, if that's the case, then there, there's pure math uh, associated to it. There's, there's going to be such a huge volume of, 
of cargo to be transported under under temperature controlled conditions that this is going to be a challenge in itself for us as an industry because of the time frame associated yeah um, I think uh, that we will not have the luxury of really being able to pinpoint it to certain individual airports I think if 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 there's going to be an international body of some sort that actually controls that um, it'll it'll come down to the point that they will have to distribute throughout any available airport that has suitable um, cooling storage to your point that not, doesn't necessarily is um, well certified in one way or the other. Yeah. Okay. And yourself, how are you fixed there? Me? Well, I'm coming well, to you, Olivier, because... Yeah, if I just, a, if I just a, finish off, it's, 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 I think yeah. it's, it's a challenge simply for, for, for the fact that um, the, and it is, I'm not only speaking for LG, I'm, I'm speaking for all the companies that I know from, 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 my, from, my, um, from my association of buddies as well. Uh, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how much volume we really look at because none of us is really willing to invest a lot of money right now for um, a lot of volume that will be there for only a very short period of time because nobody exactly. knows how this will pan out in the past, afterwards. Exactly. And that is a challenge. Exactly. Um, where I was coming from is, a, obviously, I had a discussion with Roland as well, you know, and about mm -hmm. where and how airports can actually plan ahead if they so wish and have some of these, you know, these um, temporary uh, facilities that are also reusable, you know, so what sort of considerations are they doing and where would they locate them on the airport or yeah. just off and what concessions would they give to normal, normal extension building or temporary facilities at GHA's um, locations, so... Plus, plus the fact, if I just may finish with that, uh, you know, from, from the, lad, the last I heard is that the first batch might be actually deep cold, or yeah. deep, deep, deep frozen, mm -hmm. and this will most likely change in the due course. But I mean, if, if we have to transport vaccines that need, I don't know, minus 80 degrees Celsius, I don't know how to do that. No. That's, yeah. And what, what about you, Olivier? You know, do you see that as an opportunity with some of these more more um, independent and um, capacity free airports or areas with warehousing because when the original PPE issues came in they were coming in and going straight out then they were coming in and having to be stored and they weren't being cleared or collected for some time and lots of close proximity uh, facilities around the airports started offering storage for PPE. Mm -hmm. so, you know how do you see opportunities now at an area say an airport like Liège? Well, I, I think, you know, on, on the second line side, uh, there's certainly room, you know, uh, to uh, there's, there's new sheds coming up. We, in our case, for example, we're going to get probably another, uh, you know, 14,000 square meters of uh, additional sheds um, in the coming months. And um, so it, it really depends on, on how is the, the uh, as the frame of, of the, uh, the stuff around the airport. If there is space and there could be, you know, building that can be, um, you know, used for storage. But but again, you know, with the vaccine you mentioned, you know, we're, we're talking about temperature control, and and the, the the thing is, most probably, as we all know, if there is a vaccine there, uh, you know, coming up, and and we don't know yet whether this vaccine will be a yearly vaccine to be uh, um, a yearly shot like like the flu. Oh. Yeah. Or if it will be more uh, long-term, you know, type of uh, uh, vaccine. So we're totally in, in, in the dark on that side. And not knowing what it is, it, you're absolutely right when you say you're going you're gonna to need a temporary period, you know, of storage. And then it's going to be empty. So what do you do with it? You know, I mean, uh, the, the guys who built, uh, you know, uh, um, cargo sheds or, or let's say uh, uh, warehouse to store stuff, they they want to be paid year round. They, they don't want to be paid, you know, three months because that will be the, the period of the of the shot. And then you will need to have these vaccine, you know, stored, especially in temperature control, which is which is fairly uh, expensive. Yeah, uh, which is fairly expensive. So, uh, I, you know, I I think that the room is there near nearby, you know, a smaller airport. Uh, with the big airport, it's very complicated because I think most of the neighborhoods are, are very busy already and I'm not sure there is room, you know, around Heathrow. I don't think there is room around Paris uh, uh, to, to do that. 
And additionally, the, the, the congestion of the traffic is such that, uh, again, you know, it may have to be stored, but sometimes, you know, it may have to be delivered very quickly. And so how do you deal with this? You know, you, you are, you are, you know, in, in a way you, you're cornered by so many things at the same time. Is how long it's going to stay? Will it have to be stored? Will it have to be delivered very quickly? Uh, all these things, you know, are still uncleared. Um, you know, again, yeah. I think there's room around smaller airports for sure. Now, how do you deal with the cost of this? You know, maybe, maybe you know, the three month storage will sustain the payment of one year uh, warehouse uh, rent. Why not? You know, it could be factored into the price. Yeah, who knows? But I think Patrick, you know, any any of the AOCCs or any of the representative bodies, you know, they should start discussing that now with with all of the parties just to see what the what the realistic picture is and the capability, so that there's no shocks when it does come. Mm -hmm. Now, gentlemen, with regards to some questions to wrap up, what I'd like to ask each of you. Three things that you, in your respective leadership roles and your representation of your businesses, what would you support to commit to the community or the supply chain? And also, on the other side, what would you like the supply chain to commit to that would help you in your endeavours to be more efficient, sustainable, resilient, agile, however you want to put it? So I'll start with you, Patrick. What would you like to commit to? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad nope. you said but at least I can listen to what he's going to say. <laughs> you know what, I, I, I find this so tough to answer. Um, and I, and I, I want to explain why. It, the one thing that I learned uh, throughout the last six months of just looking at my calendar is, is that we really started to live um, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, yep. nothing is the same anymore. You have to react every single day. Nothing, nothing uh, is, is, is somewhat structured anymore. And so I find it very hard to really find three items to, I could commit to because in the end of the day, nothing has changed from, from the past in a sense because you know, I, I personally would commit to being as transparent as I can be and, 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 and trying to empower the industry to become well, more, more as one as we used to be, because, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the good thing in Frankfurt was that, or in Germany rather, is that um, the finger pointing stopped. There was a lot of transparency, there was a lot of communication, but you see that trickling down again, where the new reality has, 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 has come to, to uh, attrition. And boy, I, you know, my commitment is, is to still uh, put up my finger and say, you know, you, you, you need to talk, you need to um, evolve, and you, you need to really target the things that, that have been an issue all, you know, in, in the past already. But to really come down to three points, I find that tough uh, because, yeah, I don't know, I'm, I've, I've been too reactive in the past, to really, in the past couple of weeks, um, to really be clear on that. No, it, I find this is a tough one. Okay, fair enough, fair enough, no problem. But the fact that you've said, again, you know, the transparency is so important for everybody that they, they stop being, you know, uh, you know, full of protectionism and they start being more open. And to empower the industry to be as one, definitely the finger pointing has got to stop and blaming. That's a ridiculous waste of time and effort for any senior management team. And the need to talk and evolve and target the critical points. You know, I think sometimes... People spend too much time dealing with things that they think are important or recommended, and the critical ones are the ones that slip through the, you know, the the, the grates. So I think you know. So you've covered three points there, Patrick. Okay, absolutely no problem. And Olivier, over to you. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I'm going to cover the three points. Anyway, um, you you always you know come up with with very interesting questions, Chris, just to to put everybody in trouble. But that's fine. You know, we 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 enjoy you know your. Uh, your capability on that side. Well, Michelle, I see it as giving everybody an opportunity to shine and to, and to be, you know, collaborative. So I, 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 think, I think that I on my side, I think that, yes, but I think the time is interesting in the sense that uh, I think the COVID will, 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 will bring two things to the, to, you know, at least to, to, and, and uh, into the community. First of all, I, I, I believe that, it will give an opportunity to smaller organization to uh, stand up and, and shine, as you say, and, 
and be effective. And this uh, smaller organization, and when I say smaller organization, I mean, you know, GHA with, with, uh, with a, a size which is, which is medium or, or small, um, because of their agility, because of their, uh, as, as Patrick described, you know, uh, there was a need of agility in Frankfurt uh, in, in March and, and, and he was able to cope with this. So I think there is a room for a smaller organization, you know, to come back to the game. Uh, yeah. um, and this is an opportunity for them. Um, this is also an opportunity maybe for smaller organizations, medium-sized organizations to talk together yeah. uh, and, and be, you know, more effective in the partnership in terms of uh, competing with, with the large company. Because, I mean, there, there's, there's, there's two, two types of game there. One is the one played by the large guy, which, which I know fairly well, you know, uh, given yeah. my background. And, and what's next, you know? And, and next, I think, is, is, is an opportunity for all the, again, the smaller guys to somewhat have a, a, a more effective uh, discussion, partnerships, and, and come up with, uh, because what I like with the smaller organization is, uh, you know, they, they, are, they, they have this agility that, that the big one don't have anymore. Uh, and uh, this is a unique opportunity, you know, to, to put a, a, in a way a conglomerate of uh, smaller, uh, smaller guys together and, and, and have a serious discussion on how can we be more effective. So uh, that's one. Um, the other one, again, you know, on, on e-commerce side, I, I, I guess, you know, for these uh, smaller organizations, it will be an opportunity as well. Uh, why? Because they're effective, they're agile. Um, we just have to be careful on um, how some of the big players, I mean, I'm talking about customers like Amazon, will be, will be acting in the sense of, you know, well, we see what Amazon's doing in the U.S., for example. Yeah, yeah. And clearly they, they have their flights, they have their aircraft, they have their handling now. They're handled by some of the, you know, some of the GHA there, but one of them, they just bought it. And it, it's, it's a demonstration that where these guys are heading uh, and clearly they're heading to a fully controlled internal uh, uh, vertical uh, uh, integration uh, of uh, all the service around the um, what, what, what their aim is, which is, you know, uh, selling goods. And um, I guess there is enough small e-commerce boy today yeah. in China and, and elsewhere in the world to keep, to keep the, the GHA way busy. But we are we can be sure that the big guys like amazon like maybe you know alibaba like maybe jd are looking at a, a full integration of service and that's that's uh that's something we need to keep in mind yeah yeah and, and, and um, i agree with you there about the uh, consolidation of smaller parties so that they do things without the costs involved and share some of the benefits so that's a that's a great opportunity for anybody that's listening um, now, Patrick, on what would you like to see coming from the community very quickly, because we're about, we're getting close to wrap up. What would you say? Yeah, I'm going to be the broken record here. Um, be transparent, communicate, and, and work on the digitization front. And really be serious about it this time. Very good. That's precise. Very good. And, okay, let's just put that one. And yourself, Olivier, last and final words. Well... I, I joined Patrick very much on, uh, you know, about digitalization. This time, be serious, move on. Anyway, uh, I think the e-commerce side will lead the will will show the way, because they are actually very active on that side. Yeah. And there is massive development in the digitalization side for with these guys, and I know some very. I mean, very interesting organization, which, are, to be honest, I had no clue they were existing. To be very, very sharp on this and be very effective on, for, you know, on being able to trace and track the goods and, and fast in terms of uh, return of information, delivery of information, proof of delivery, all of this, you know. Um, so uh, if, if the, the, the general cargo side, put it this way, does not, you know, uh, um, react the same way. Um, I think they're going to be distanced by yeah. by this kind of, these guys, and um, you know, and I, 
no, that's that's about it. I think the the my my uh, perspective is really that um, I engage small organization, you know, to get going on that, and uh, and be be serious about all of this. Yeah, no, very very good, gentlemen. As always, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, we're at the end of the session now, so really appreciate it. Um, it's always a great pleasure to talk with you both. And uh, thank you for what we've done in the past, what you've done now, and hopefully what will be done in the future. So really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Bye-bye, uh, Patrick. Bye, Chris. Bye-bye.